Hi, my name is Amaya Lam, and I'm a senior at Science Leadership Academy. And for my capstone, I'm going to be doing a two-part video essay series. And this one is dedicated to autistic coding in the media. I want you to picture this. You're some white guy in his, let's say, early to late 20s, and you're super into science, trains, math, all that kind of stuff. You're socially awkward and seem to always speak very bluntly. Congratulations, that's what most autistic representation is like in the media. Autistic representation in the media has never been diverse, and so audiences are left to attach and relate to characters that are artistic coded. This name is pretty self-explanatory and means the same respective thing as to other similar terms, such as queer coded. This is when a character will be given traits of autism without explicitly saying they are autistic, and this process is often accidental, especially with autistic coding. Most autistic coding in the past has no diversity and is shown through characters as I described in the beginning, white, male, and weird. This limited representation of autism through the media is harmful to the autism community. Autism is such a diverse and varied spectrum disorder, so to only create characters with autistic traits as these creates stereotypes and a black and white understanding of what autism is. Some of these characters are Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, Sean Murphy from The Good Doctor, and Sam Gardner from Atypical. While these characters are not coded autistic as it is part of their explicit characterization, it shows how surface level and monotonous representation is, and this same principle applies to autistic coding. I'm also not saying that you can enjoy these types of characters or shows. Sheldon Cooper is very widely loved as a character and is found enjoyable and funny, but to not acknowledge the issues behind these types of characters is irresponsible. There's a consistent pattern when it comes to characters who are perceived as autistic within the media. They all seem to serve a specific function. The two main ones that I'll be focusing on are humor and the burden. With humor, who doesn't get a laugh about someone who can't seem to understand the unspoken rules of society and is then ridiculed by the characters in the show and the audience? This event is never fun to experience and in turn to watch. Creators will make characters that exhibit traits such as having something that resembles a special interest, repetitive behaviors, not getting jokes, talking bluntly, and a lot more, and they will use these as a source of comedic relief for the audience as they consume the media. While it's not inherently bad that these characters are made to be humorous, in fact, I think it's one of the main reasons I find a lot of autistic coded characters to be so lovable, but I think there's a fundamental difference between a character with autistic traits being funny and a character being funny because of their autistic traits and only existing to be ridiculed. This trope or function can be seen in characters such as Drax, Michael Scott, Luna Lovegood, and so many more. The second function I've observed is to be a burden. Media will take these autistic traits and demonize them to add conflict to a story. A very common example is oftentimes a character will have one specific interest that they'll be slightly obsessive over and that will add hurdles to the plot. Take Entrapta from She-Ra and the Princess of Power as an example. She is incredibly autistic coded and her special interest can be seen as robots or anything related to technology. She's incredibly passionate about this interest and it often helps the other characters accomplish their goals and lead to revelations or developments. But this passion often gets in the way of the plot and what the other characters need to get done in order to solve the conflict. In one scene, the other characters go as far to put Entrapta on a leash to control her because she keeps getting distracted by the surrounding technology. This is a consistent pattern within the show and its treatment of Entrapta, and it's why she's a problematic autistic coded character. Nonetheless, I still love her and she's one of my favorite characters from She-Ra, but this is not without acknowledging the issues behind her character. The other characters are constantly annoyed at Entrapta's behavior, a behavior that can be interpreted as autism, and she functions to be a burden to the rest of the cast a majority of the time. Creators often need a character or characters to fill these functions, and thus by filling these functions, they need a quirky or weird character or plot device, which coincides with autistic traits, hence why autistic coding is accidental a lot of the time. With these functions, we also have to understand the role of misogyny. When a female character is autistic coded, these traits will be portrayed and perceived in a negative light, having them more likely to function as a burden. When a male character is autistic coded, it will be portrayed and perceived as more acceptable and likable, and thus they're more likely to function as humor. Audiences are also more likely to find female autistic coded characters annoying, but sympathize with the male characters. 
And Trapta also gets me to talk about another issue with autistic coding, infantilization. Infantilization is when an adult or someone who is just not a child is treated as a child despite not needing such treatment. Going back to the leash scene with Entrapta, the reason I find this scene so problematic and infantilizing is because one, Entrapta is one of the older characters in the show, and the act of putting a leash on someone, for lack of a better phrase, is usually associated with children, like leash kids, because they can't be controlled and need to be supervised. The fact that one of the older characters in the show is put on a leash is very infantilizing because it's like, Entrapta is a full-fledged adult. She doesn't need to be treated like a child, and her characteristics that correlate to autism are not something that makes her needed to be treated as such. Infantilization also feeds into the stereotype that autistic people are not or cannot be sexual. People will view autistic people closer to children and treat them as such. They'll think they can't function on their own, and it's much more common to see people call autistic people cute or adorable rather than something like hot. One of the problems that can arise with autism coding is that they can be perceived as autistic simply because of infantilization. A character may not be very sexual or they'll be innocent or just not have interest in romantic or sexual relations. And because of this, a character may be seen as autistic coded or vice versa, while they'll be autistic coded and thus not be seen as capable of being sexual. Now we're going to go into one of my favorite autistic coded characters and see how autistic coding is used. For one, we have Elsa from Frozen. Elsa is both queer and autistic coded, and both of these things can coexist at the same time. Her character can be taken as both a queer metaphor and an autism metaphor, which is why she's one of my favorite examples to use for both scenarios. At a young age, her powers were something she accepted in herself and wasn't ashamed of them. However, once she got older, she began to shield and mask them more. This often happens to autistic people where our behavior will not be seen as weird as a child because it's more socially acceptable. But once we get older, the standards to act a certain way become higher and more demanding. As an adult, Elsa hides her powers, which is a metaphor for masking when neurodivergent people will mimic neurotypical people, particularly in social settings, to be seen as more acceptable. Her powers are not socially accepted and she's been conditioned to conceal them, and so she masks them. Then, towards the end of the film, she learns to accept her powers and she goes through self-acceptance. There are also a bunch of smaller reasons why I think she's autistic coded, such as her gloves perhaps being a comfort sensory item to her, and how she's prone to emotional breakdowns or meltdowns, but her powers are the main metaphor and lens I looked at autism coding through. Another one of my favorite media that has many autistic coded characters is the manga and anime series Bungo Stray Dogs by Kafka Asagiri. I think literally the most autistic coded character I've ever seen is Rampo Edagawa. There's so much to say about his character and autism, I don't even really know where to start. For one, Rampo has a very obvious special interest, detective work, and solving crimes. He's incredibly smart, but often thinks in ways that others cannot keep up with and has trouble getting social cues and norms. He has safe foods, which are any types of snacks or sweets. While these are the more general traits that I see him coded for, it becomes truly interesting once we get to his own light novel that focuses on his life when he was 14 years old. When he was younger, he lived with his parents, who were also incredibly smart detectives, and Rampo and his parents were able to keep up with one another. They understood each other's thinking. They lived outside the city, and Rampo grew up pretty sheltered, only interacting with his parents. His parents then passed away when he was 14, and he soon moved out to the new city. Long story short, Rampo goes through something that can be seen as a meltdown where he expresses how he doesn't understand how other people work. In this new environment, he is overstimulated and isn't used to the way people think and act because he was always around his parents who understood him. There are a bunch more characters I could argue for being autistic coded, such as Lilo from Lilo and Stitch, Beth Harmon from The Queen's Gambit, pretty much all of the Umbrella Academy characters, Jess from New Girl, Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender, like all the Big Hero 6 characters and Bob's Burgers characters, Candace Everdeen from The Hunger Games, Dipper and Mabel from Gravity Falls. And while everyone's opinions on autistic coding is going to be different, I personally can't help but prefer coding autism rather than purposely making autistic characters. More times than not, coding can lead to better representation anyway, unfortunately. The truth is that most creators are neurotypical and therefore do not understand and know how to write autism in stories, at least intentionally that is, without continuing to feed into stereotypes or harmful tropes. In turn, autistic coding also subconsciously affects the way society views autistic people, both positively and negatively.